hit hard, and all of a sudden it stopped, and he turned away. For a minute there, there was a demon facing me. That was not my son. And then after the second attack, all of a sudden my son was back there. And he left. I ended up with a neck and back injuries, intensive throat injuries, infected my, my sight and my hearing. And I had a case of PTSD you wouldn't believe. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, and I kept reliving the whole thing. The Lord brought that song into my life, the eye of the storm. He let me know he had me. The people in my church didn't know what to do with me. One, one day I ended up uh, laying on my bed crying. I've been doing homeless ministry in the White River, West Lebanon area. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even eat or sleep. I was a wreck. And I was laying on my bed, and I said to the Lord, I talk to the Lord all the time, sometimes in my head, sometimes out loud. I said, Lord, am I ever going to be of any use to you or anybody else? Ever. I had a vision. Normal people don't have visions, in my opinion. I had one that night. I was wide awake. I saw those wrecking balls, big wrecking balls that you see in the city where they take down buildings. I saw this brick building. I saw this wrecking ball. It taken it right down to the foundation. And the Lord said to me, that's you. Boy, was he right. And then I saw a pair of hands come in, and they started mortaring the bricks back together, even the bricks were broken. And he started rebuilding from the foundation up. And what he said to me was, this is you, and I'm going to rebuild you from the foundation up. But it would be all different, and it would be all new. And then the sense of peace came over me. And I fell asleep. And when I woke up the next morning, the PTSD was totally gone. <laughs> and it never came back. In the last two and a half years, I've walked in that vision. I didn't know what he meant about rebuilding me. I didn't know what he was going to do with me. I ended up moving out of the area two years ago. I moved up here but two years ago this August. I moved up here just to be out of the area where my son was. Um, I don't know what's going on in his life. He hasn't sought help. He hasn't gone back to, to the Lord. He, uh, he's still doing drugs and alcohol. And I'm as powerless over his drug addiction and his alcoholism as I am over my own. That's part of the human condition, you see. We, we, want, to, we want to be able to fix things. We want to be able to be self-sufficient. We want to run on our own power. And it isn't doable. It isn't doable because we're fallen. We're fallen and we, we, we don't have that power of ourselves anymore. So I never understood what the vision meant until I met Pastor Tim. And he helped me to an immense degree. I told him one day I'd never told anybody about the vision. I figured if you told somebody, they were going to call a paddy wagon and take you away. <laughs> well, I've had two visions now. The other, the, the other one had to do with, a, I asked the Lord what he wanted of me, and he, he said, die to self. And he yeah. gave me a second vision. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to do that. You're going to have to walk me through that one, too. So I came to this 
Presbyterian. And uh, I came here initially. I had a place under contract in East Brookfield. But it fell. And the next six places that I, the six, first six places that I kept, all fell through. And I ended up living in Rygate, which is where I live now. And last, this last January, he moved me back into this church, which is where I thought he was going to bring me two years ago. Mm -hmm. And he's been doing really awesome things in my life. My, uh, my background is I've always kind of been jealous of you people that grew up in the church, you know. I didn't have that. I, uh, I came from a non-believing family. Um, for some reason, uh, I was always an avid reader. And I would look up anything I could find in the house to read. And nobody ever talked about the Lord. But I found three Bibles in this what we call the other room, this extra room. There were boxes of books under the bed, and I found three bottles. And this little girl, who hadn't even started school yet, read Bibles. And I didn't understand much of what they read, which I read, I just, I had a heart for the Lord, very early on. But I had nobody around me that was a believer. And he stepped into my life through this Baptist preacher came by one, one uh, summer and wanted my mother to let me go to uh, Bible school for a couple weeks and to get me out of her hair, she sent me. I think she everlastingly regretted that because I came home preaching. <laughs> <laughs> Used to bug her, ask her if she believed in the Lord, and she kind of pushed me away. Never did get any answer there, but I think that probably my parents had believed at one time, but you see, my brother was born crippled. He was born in, with cerebral palsy. And I think that my parents did what a lot of people do. That we blame God when bad things happen. We blame everybody. We blame God. God won't do it. And God gets blamed for so many things he had no part of. We don't want to take responsibility for our own decisions, our own actions, and the natural consequences that come with those. So we blame anybody, like Adam blamed Eve, and he blamed the serpent, and they both blame God. God, why did you make that woman and give her to me? You know, why did you? Why did you allow the serpent in the garden? Why didn't you destroy Satan when, when he first fell in heaven? And we've got all these things we do. Well, my parents never came back to the Lord. My mother died the year after Hurricane Irene, and neither her or my brother ever came to the Lord. My father, I found out when I came into AA, was a falling down drunk. And, uh, but when I came into AA in 1986, I, I found out that he had the same disease I had, and that brought some element of forgiveness uh, for him for the things that he had done. He had booted my mother and my brother and I out on the street with nowhere to go when I was 13 years old. And uh, I don't know what happened before that, the first 13 years of my life, because I blotted it all out. So I, I come from a pretty traumatic, non-believing background. And it took the Lord until I was in my middle age to leave me into the church. I ended, up with, I ended up with multiple addictions. So I go back to something Pastor Tim used to talk about. And when we're not right with God, we, uh, we aren't comfortable. So we stick all kinds of things in our lives, usually things that aren't bad, that aren't, that aren't good for us, that are create more problems, to try to make ourselves feel better. 
Well, my parents never said I love you, so what my mother did was she fed me. She was, a, she was addicted to sugar and caffeine. And so she fed me sweet stuff all the time, and I, I ended up with weight problems early on. Sugar was my first addiction. Caffeine was my second, alcohol was my third, and we went downhill from there. The year after I started drinking habitually at 27, uh, my whole priorities flip-flopped in 24 hours. I went from I went from working at the phone company and having a very good job and having a couple businesses that I did. I, re I raised uh, Morgan and Arab horses and I was raising German Shepherds. I did art work on permission. I was studying karate. I, I had a life. And somebody to go up, got me to go out to a bar one night and I had a drink. And instantaneously, in 24 hours, my priorities totally flip-flopped. And the devil led me, but I didn't know it yet. I became a relationship addict. I wasn't okay alone. I stuffed people in my life, all the wrong kinds of people. I went from 115 pounds at one point in my life to weighing 220. Well, the 220 was when I drew the scale out because it obviously didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like Nile. I think I probably went up to 250. Um, I, I just went from one addiction to the other. And me, after I had my son at about 180, the other pictures I couldn't even find, I threw them away. They were so disastrous. You know, if you don't have pictures of it, it didn't exist. Amen. <laughs> I'm an expert in self-justification self and rationalization and denial. <laughs> At any rate, the, the Lord got me into uh, an AA program in, a, in a, about the strangest way you can imagine. I, uh, I had been my boyfriend that arrested for DWI. He didn't want to go to um, a meeting alone, so he grabbed a little old genie by the scruff of the neck and hauled me along. But he was a blackout drinker. He didn't even know I had a problem. So I went to speaker meetings with him for about three months, and I started to identify with the things that the speakers were saying. So I went to Todd, and I said, hey, Todd, I think I'm an alcoholic. Ugh, you don't have no problem. You don't have no problem. He said, Todd, how would you know? You have two drinks. You're in a blackout. You would know if an elephant ran over me. <laughs> At any rate, I started telling the guys in the, in the speaker meeting, I said, I really like to be an alcoholic. You're such a bunch of nice people. It'd be nice to be able to belong here. And they, they laughed and they told me, well, you keep coming back. You'll do until a real alcoholic comes along. <laughs> they already had my number. They told me to go out and try controlled drinking, so they asked me how many drinks I drank, and I said, I don't know, who counts? Well, the next time I was out, I counted 33 drinks. I wasn't drinking ladies' drinks, I was drinking hard stuff straight up. Some guy told me that this wasn't a woman's drink, I'd take his bottle away and finish it for him, look for another one. At any rate, so when I went back to AA and reported to them, I drank 33 drinks and walked away sober. Mm. I kind of went. He suggested to me that I try controlled drinking, so I did. I was fighting for my right to drink, so I said I'll cut it down to two drinks a day for the next two weeks. I did. I went back and reported in. They said, the next suggestion, they said, how about you try quitting for a year? So I gave a bit of a macho beehive. Took them on on that one, too. <coughs> Great way to get me to do things close to dare me. So I, I always took them off. I went into DTs, those of you that don't know what alcoholic is, uh, uh, alcoholic withdrawal is, I went into DTs from an alcoholic withdrawal that night at home alone. Now, they, my only knowledge of God was from that two weeks of Bible school and reading the Bible. But we all have a 
God-sized hole in us, and we all have it seem to be built into us that when we're in trouble, we cry out to God. Even the atheists, even the agnostics, when their life's on the line, they'll call out to God. Well, I did that night, too. I called out to him, and my bargain was, so you take the DTs away, you take away whatever this is, and I'll go back to the AA meeting tomorrow night. Well, guess what? He did. <laughs> and guess what I did? I took it back. It's like, nice and peaceful now, no need to go, you know. And he gave it back. We played that game three times. By the time I got through, I was totally convinced that the guy upstairs had about enough of my crap. And he put his foot down and said, you got a choice. You can either have the DTs or you can go back to the meetings itself. My alcohol intake had tripled. I found out how well it works doing it without a program and without a God. Every time somebody had something that I had been addicted to there, it was like a fly going through molasses, and I went down. So by the time I got to AA, I was at the surrender point. I had accepted my powerlessness over alcohol. I had accepted it in a lot of other, a lot of other areas. My walk in the last 33 years in the AA programs I, can't, I have had to come to my terms of my powerlessness over a lot of things. Sugar, food addictions, caffeine, rage at one point. I became a rageaholic after my, my husband abandoned me and my two little kids in the middle of the night for another woman. He divorced me and then he came back and he took my kids and gave, gave them all to the other woman because she couldn't have kids. I had rage like you wouldn't believe. I prayed for help with that. And I didn't get the help and I didn't understand why. Last year I was working with a woman. She was having rage problems and I said to you, my, her, her, I used to have a rage problems. She said, how can you get rid of them? And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't have them anymore. I had to go back and take it to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, why did you not help me when I was asking for help with the rage? And why is it gone now when I don't even know when it left? And what I got told was I had had unforgiveness and anger toward my, my ex for abandoning me. And as long as I chose, and it was my choice, as long as I chose to stay in that unforgiveness, <coughs> that anger. He couldn't help me. Mm. Well. Look at the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us mm. as we forgive those who trust us mm. against us. Well. And somewhere after I came to the came to the Lord, he got me to give up that unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. And then he removed the rage. Mm -hmm. And I never knew he did it. I still, to this day, do not know when he did it. But I went back to the lady I was working with, and I said, I explained what I just said to you. I said to her, by, do you by any chance have any unforgiveness toward anybody? She gave me a list about 15 long. The top one was her husband who had beat her and abandoned her. And so I explained what the Lord had told me. He said, this is what you need to do if you want to get rid of that rage. You need to forgive him. She said, I don't feel like it. He said, feeling has nothing to do with it. What it has to do with it is obedience to the Lord. This isn't a option. This is a requirement. You don't have to feel like it. You just have to say, Lord, because you require this, I choose to forgive whoever the person is. Now, would you please make my feelings and my actions <coughs> coincide with that? Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so I told her that she chose to stay in the unforgiveness, and 
she still has the rage problems. And I'm powerless over that too. But I shared what I had to share and the words are there. And if she decides she wants a way out, she's got a way out. The last couple of weeks when I've been talking to the Lord about what he wanted me to preach, he said, <coughs> I've already written the sermon. The sermon is your life. That only God can take somebody who's an alcoholic and can't stay sober for one day and give them 33 years sobriety. Only if God can take a person that was an alcoholic, was an addict, and have them off it for 35 years. Amen. Only God can take a person who was a sex addict and a relation addict, and I've been alone, single, and celibate for 19. The way that I live, I weigh 100 pounds less than I used to. I didn't do any of that. Every one of these things was accomplished because he brought me face to face with my powerlessness, brought me into surrender, and then through the infilling of the Holy Spirit did for me what I could not do for myself. Amen. And so he has written his sermon on my life. I came to the church a while ago and said I, I'm finding people in the church that have addiction problems. Some of them it's sugar, some of them it's caffeine, some of it's food. Some have gone back into drugs or alcohol. Some it's their relatives, they have the problem and we really need a Christian foster program here at this church. And they came back to me. Why didn't I foresee that? They came back to me and said, do you want to be the facilitator? And I'm like, uh, who, me? But I said yes, because I told the Lord whatever I was asked to do, I'd never say no. I had gone to AA for about the first eight years of, of uh, my being sober. And then something happened. I was healed in one day. I had a bunch of physical maladies that were extremely painful and it had driven me to the point of feeling suicidal. I was on my way to an AA meeting one night and I was lying bridge abutments. And I'm not a suicidal person and I'm certainly not a violent way, but I was thinking about it. My husband had told me I was worthless as a, light, a wife and a mother. My mother was saying the same thing. I wanted out. A song came on the Christian radio station. He speaks to me a lot through his word and through song. He said, hold on for one more day. The next day I went to the first church. He led me into a Christian church where the pastor was an ex-cop out of New York City. We'd been an alcoholic, and the Lord healed him. And one day of his alcoholism, and put him to work as a pastor in South Wellington, Vermont. And there were a bunch of us that were addicts and alcoholics that also went to a Christian church there. I went to church and I asked for prayer, the way it says in the Bible, to be anointed with oil. Have the elders pray over you. But I saw the look on their faces when they were praying over me, and they didn't believe. And I walked away, and nothing had happened. And on the way home, I reached out to the Lord, and I said, I don't care if they believed or not, I believe. Yeah. You said, hold on for one more day, meet me. He did. Yeah. I got home that day, I got sick, I got diarrhea like you've never had. I was having muscle spasms really, really bad. But that was part of the problem. I couldn't even walk straight. The muscle spasms were pulling the bones out of place in my legs. I fell into things. I had black and blue spots all over me. I couldn't get out of bed without 
morning and got up to take care of my kids. My range of motion had been about like this. Couldn't move my arms forward any more than this. Couldn't walk a straight line. I was sitting on the couch with my kids and I looked down and I was sitting cross-legged in Indian style. And I looked down and I went, I can't do that. And I got up and I leaned over and I put my elbows to the floor. And I stepped back and I kicked straight over my head. And then I started yelling hallelujah and calling everybody I could think of to tell them what the Lord had done. After the healing, I went back to AA, and I bore witness to what the Lord had done for me, because they had seen me come in day after day into these meetings crippled. Some of them believed me, some did not. I don't know how they could disbelieve it, because they were looking at the evidence. I was seeing a psychiatrist at the time, because of the depression and being suicidal, I walked into his office and Stephen Blecko came straight upright and he looked at me and he said, what happened? And again, I bore witness to the Lord. He had no explanation for it. After a couple months, he said, you're released. There's absolutely nothing I can do for you because you, you've been healed. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, and all of it. But the AA people, you know what, remember, they started calling me a Bible cover. And uh, they could take their higher power and name whoever they wanted, but it wasn't okay for me to claim the God of the Bible and Jesus as my higher power. So they pushed me away. Well, I was a baby Christian. I hadn't been in a Christian church only about less than a year. They drove me out. I let them drive me out. I didn't know about the great controversy. I didn't know about Satan. I didn't know how to do spiritual warfare and stand my ground. I do now. Amen. So I left. But the Lord kept my sobriety in the palm of his hand. In the next 25 years, I never went to an AA meeting, and the Lord kept me sober. <coughs> Without fail, I haven't had the urge to drink, even momentarily, in over 30 years. And uh, that's how the Lord does things. When he does them, he does them perfectly. And I thought that's the way my life was going to be. But after it came up about starting a Christian 12-step group within the church, the Lord put it on my heart to go back to A. Well, needless to say, after what had happened there, I wasn't too happy to go. But he showed me, he had taught me the things through Pastor Tim that I needed to know, and that I was capable of standing my ground this time around. So six weeks ago, I got sent back into the AA groups, and I've been to meetings in my home area, in Bradford, Wells River, South Newberry, Wells River, and an awful lot over here to Barry and up to Waterbury. And I have spoken and chaired more meetings in the last, I've probably been to 50 some odd meetings in the last six weeks. And the Lord has opened the doors in every place I've walked into. I've been asked to share and speak. When he said to me that he wanted me to go back, he said, you shall declare me before men. And I said, Lord, how shall I declare you? And he put it on me to put the cross back on. Mm -hmm. Here I had no reason to declare it because you're all 
Christians do. I put the cross back on. When I care or speak, when I'm at the end of my story, I say, my higher power is the God of the Bible and Jesus. Not one person has come against me. Amen. The other day I went to a meeting down here in Barry. And on the chairperson's desk was a little card about eBay. I was looking at it bottom side up, but I looked down and I was sure it was a depiction of Christ. I reached over and I turned the car, card over, and on it it said, if you're struggling with addictions, Christ can help. Amen. Amen. Now the other people that are there, that are Christian, are starting to come out of the woodwork. And they're starting to dare to identify who their higher power is Amen. and what he's done to them. For them. I don't know, at some point here we're going to try to start a Christian 12-step group here. Any, any, I want to do a general 12-step group to confront any type of addiction. Anybody's going to be able to come? Whether you have a re relative or a friend that's an alcoholic, your adult child is an alcoholic, your Al-Anon member, if you have a food addiction, you know, sugar, drugs, alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, whatever your problem is, I want it to be open to everybody. I don't know when that's going to happen. I know the Lord's got me on the training ground right now. One of the things he put on my heart was at the end times, you know, our lives are going to be on the line. We're going to be required to bear witness to Christ before men. If we're not willing to do it now, we won't be able to do it then. We won't. So he put me on a training ground where I have to stand for what I believe in. The other thing Christ said to me was, and you can believe this or not, but the Lord does talk to me. And it's biblical. The Bible says, you will hear my voice. It will instruct you which way to turn to the right or the left. My sheep hear my voice. I'm one of the sheep. Amen. I hear his voice and I try to follow his instructions. What he said to me was, if you declare me before men, I will declare you before the Father in heaven. Amen. If you are ashamed of me before men, or you deny me before men, I also will deny you. I told Pastor Jim that. He said, that's pretty heavy duty. I said, yes, but it's the truth. This isn't the sermon I came up here to preach. But I guess it's what the Lord wanted me to say. Amen. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.